Uh, it's really exciting to have someone come here with us. Um, just a, as a brief introduction on our guest today, uh, as I said, he is the CEO of Khan Academy, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide free, world class education for anyone, anywhere. Uh, and I'm very pleased to know that you are making progress with that mission, that you have 150 million learners uh, worldwide today, and people are learning in uh, uh, more than 50 languages, uh, I believe now. Uh, if, uh, like me, you've ever tried to study something online, any subject, maths, physics, biology, uh, for me it was calculus, I uh, did that in 2008 when I was just started university, you probably came across Khan Academy, uh, and so we, we all uh, know and recognize the name. So it's no surprise that Khan here, Salman Khan here is uh, recognized as one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. Uh, he also holds three degrees from MIT and an MBA from Harvard Business School. We're here today, of course, to talk about uh, your, uh, your book. Uh, and as I said, the, the title of the book already brings forward an argument, right? And, and I think that you did a, a great job at uh, justifying the argument. And the fact that we all know that generative AI is here and is impacting the way we live our lives, impacting the way we learn things. And uh, the title of the book is, um, you know, uh, Brave New Words, How uh, AI will revolutionize education and why that is a good thing. So that is the main topic of today. So we're going to talk about AI. We're going to discuss what does that mean right now and what it means for the future. Uh, but yeah, so that is, that is why we're here today. So without further ado, let me uh, pass it on to you and yeah, for any opening remarks, um, uh, Salman Khan, everyone. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, No, I, 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 uh, one, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'll just start off with a little bit of context for those of y'all who might be less familiar with Khan Academy, or at least the journey of, of how we've gotten here. And I've always used to tell the story of how Khan Academy got started, just as a, a little bit of a quirky way of how, we, how, how I fell into this. Uh, but I think as we talk about artificial intelligence, it actually has a lot of relevance um, in, in terms of at least how I think about the problem. You rewind back almost 20 years ago, uh, it was 2004, I was in Boston, I was a year out of business school, I had just gotten married, my wife is here. Um, and I, I, right after the wedding, I had family visiting us in the Northeast in Boston from New Orleans, and New Orleans is where I was born and raised, and it just came out of conversation that my 12-year-old cousin Navia was having trouble with math. I offered to tutor her when she went back to New Orleans, she agreed, slowly but surely she got caught up with her class. And it was really about, one, building up her self-esteem, but then also filling in gaps that she had, and really learn, teaching her in a, in a personalized way. I'll keep saying that word probably throughout, throughout the day. Um, and, and not only did she get caught up with her class, she got a little ahead of her class. And at that point, I became what I call a tiger cousin. And I uh, <laughs> called up her school, and I said, I really think Nadia should be able to retake that placement exam from last year. They said, who are you? I said, I'm her cousin. And they let her. And, and she retook it. And she, before she was put into a slower math track, now she was put into an advanced math track. Uh, so I was hooked. I started tutoring her younger brothers. Word spreads in my family. Free tutoring is going on. Uh, before I know it, I'm tutoring 10, 15 cousins, family, friends uh, all over the country. And my, I had a day job. I was an analyst at a hedge fund at, at the time. Uh, so after work, I would get on the phone, get on instant messenger, whatever I could to, to talk to my cousins. And I saw a pretty common pattern, the same pattern I saw with Nadia, and frankly, I see with pretty much any student out there. The reason why students are struggling, and it usually hits in one of these, I would call, uh, in some ways, capstone classes that, are, that integrate all of the knowledge that you had before. So when you get into an algebra class in seventh, eighth, ninth grade, it's usually expected that you're fluent in most of your arithmetic and pre-algebra skills, that you know how to take exponents and decimal, divide decimals and negative numbers, et cetera. And what I found with my cousins is that um, most of these students, did my microphone kick up? I'll, OK, oh, I'm back, all right. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, is this the jet lag? I'm just. Uh, I'm with you. <laughs> uh, but it, the reason why most of my cousins were struggling was that they had little gaps in their knowledge. Either they never learned it well in the first place. We've all been in the traditional school system. You take a test, maybe you get an 80% on it, the class moves on to the next concept. Even though the next concept's likely to build on those, that 20% that you didn't happen to know. 
or even if you got 100%, summer break happens and by next year comes around, you forgot some of it. Sometimes you review it, sometimes you don't. And so the value that I was able to do as a, as a tutor, and this is what tutors do typically, is because it's one-on-one, -on -one, I can adjust to where the student is. Oh, we need to review that. Okay, now you can do that. And it's a much faster way of, of, of advancing it. Um, and I didn't have the terminology back then. I was just intuitive that this was a better way to, to help someone. Uh, and I saw it accelerating my uh, cousins and, and, and family friends. Uh, but it turns out Benjamin Bloom, and I write about this in the book, you know, educational psychologist, he tried to quantify this effect of one-on-one of -on -one tutoring. And there's been debates since his paper in 1984. You know, he, he found a very large effect. I know I'm talking to a, a pretty um, a sophisticated audience here. You know, he says two standard deviation effect. He called it the two sigma problem. Uh, since then, there's been many other studies that they've seen more of like 0.4 standard deviations, which is still considered a pretty big effect size. Uh, but once again, I say even with the 0.4, that's with any tutoring. It's not saying whether you're getting great tutoring or, or mediocre tutoring. Uh, but he, saw, he said, look, if you, if you have someone learning in a personalized framework, mastery learning, where if you haven't learned it well or if you forgot it, you keep working on it, that it can take that student in the 50th percentile and bring them to the 95th or the 96th percentile. And that's what I saw happening to my, to my own cousins. So anyway, long story short, um, I started writing uh, uh, software for them. My original background was in software, so it was just a fun family project to give them more practice problems for me as a tutor to keep track. Then a friend suggested I make YouTube videos. At first, I thought it was a silly idea, but I did it. My cousins famously told me they liked me better on YouTube than in person. <laughs> I kept going. Um, and they, what they were saying is they liked the on-demand version of it. I think they liked me in their life, um, uh, et cetera. Um, but if you think about everything from those days, almost 15, 20 years ago to now, and Khan Academy is now much more than me, um, it's really just trying to scale up that type of one-on-one -on -one tutoring that I was able to do with my, my cousins. Either scale it up for a student who is just using Khan Academy on the side as a supplement, scaling it up for a student who might be in a part of the world where they don't have access to a classroom, or scaling it up for a formal use in a classroom where your typical teacher, they have 30 kids in the room, they know that those 30 students are all in different places and need different things, but it's very hard to address their individual needs. And so a lot of what we've been doing over the last 15 years is, can we make tools where the kids can work at their own time and pace, be supported by the software, the videos, but the most important support is the teacher. And so we give the teacher data, and then the teacher, instead of giving the same thing to everyone, they can start to personalize. They can say, OK, 10 kids are having trouble with this concept. Let's work on that with those 10 kids while the other kids can keep progressing, uh, et cetera. So you, you then fast forward to about almost two years ago, and, and then that's when OpenAI reached out to us. And this was six months before ChatGPT came out. What they showed us was what would eventually become GPT-4. Uh, many of y'all know that even when ChatGPT did get released, it was based off of GPT-3.5. It was actually a bit of an accidental release. They didn't expect it to do anything, because uh, GPT-3.5 was out for six, seven months. In fact, any of us could have written a chat app on top of it. No one did. Uh, OpenAI did just to show what it could do, and then the world uh, got excited. Uh, but when we saw what it was capable of, uh, even though it has a, had and still has a lot of imperfections, we said, you know, this could get that much closer to emulating the type of tutoring that I was able to do with Nadia or that Benjamin Bloom envisioned in 1984. And so that's when we started uh, digging really deep into it. And, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, I, I, the title is intentionally a little provocative, um, mainly because most of the conversation around AI has focused on the negative. And I don't want to pretend that I'm ignoring the negative. There's a lot of negative. We can talk. I can scare you if I want to about uh, ways that it could go bad. Uh, but one of the things, and one of the things I told our team when we first had access, and in our own team we had these debates. Where, you know, people rightfully said, "But wait, this could be used for cheating. This has math errors. This could make up facts. Um, students can have inappropriate conversations with an AI." And what I told them, and I use this term a lot in the book, "educated bravery," is, "Look, those are real risks. We can't ignore them." But those aren't reasons to run away from it. Those are reasons to engineer around it, to, to build things that actually could turn many of those things in, into features. And what I'm telling everyone, not just in the education space, is any technology, you know, from the wheel to fire to you know, uh, a knife, it, 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 these are all, to a steam engine, uh, these are all amplifications of human intent. A knife can be used to kill, it can be used to cook. Um, and AI is no different. 
And so we already know that bad actors are going to use it to amplify their bad intent. Fraud, you know, deep fakes, we can go on and on about what they're going to do. And no matter how many rules or regulations you pass, the bad folks aren't going to, they're going to ignore them. Um, so good folks, I think we have a choice. Do we just wring our hands and you know, um, do nothing? Or do we put even more energy on the positive intent, amplifying that intent? And that's really the spirit of the book. Um, not to pretend like everything's rosy, but to say the only way that this ends up in more of a, a, a positive than a negative is if good people proactively try to amplify positive intent in education and other places. Brilliant. That was great. Uh, I had very much fun reading your book because I, I, I do share the enthusiasm and I do think, um, and you do portray it fairly though, like you do mention it, some of the, like the risks and some of the problems that we need to to uh, reconcile when we are integrating AI into everything. Um, so well, let's go there a little bit just because you, you, you opened that. So you're very right that one, as soon as ChatGPT became a very popular tool, and that was the main thing that everyone was using, it, that was the first thing that educators thought, right? <laughs> they're gonna cheat. Uh, students are gonna cheat and they're gonna do that. Um, do you think, uh, as you said, like you're building on top of it, you're, you're creating safeguards, you're, you're, you're building uh, on the tool, but there, there still is a risk of cheating, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you see that? How do you see the current risk of cheating? And is that something we should not uh, focus our energy so much? Or should we build more around it? Or yeah, how, the, how is the cheating? Yeah, oh the, oh, the cheating is very real. Uh, and it's happening. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. But what I, write, you know, I have a whole chapter on cheating in the book. Uh, and what I point out, I always like to start even before, you know, not to get fixated on the technology, just like what, what, was, what was going on even before ChatGPT came out? Turns out there was a lot of cheating. Um, I, 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 mainly U.S. universities is probably not so different here in the in the U.K. But you know there were su surveys I, I cited in the book of the the students. Writers. Yeah, or, well, students just saying to what degree. You know, Stanford recently had to reverse some of their honor code. I was actually blown away. It was a little bit ridiculous. If it, it, at Stanford until recently, professors weren't allowed to be in the room when students take an exam which I think almost showed a distrust. It almost builds distrust. But at the same time, they told students that if you see someone cheating, you have to report it. So it's really putting students in a very hard situation. Because if you do report it, then that student could get kicked out, et cetera, so no one reported it. That's a bad situation. They recently reversed that, thank thankfully. Uh, but you already had a cheating phenomenon going on. Um, there were already, before chat GPT, it's, you could, it took me 10 seconds to do a web search. Maybe, you know, if you do a search for write my paper, there are companies that are happy to find an English PhD. In, uh, it, it's actually predominantly in Nigeria and Kenya. These great writers will write a paper for you for $5 a page. You know, I don't blame them. It's a good livelihood for them. Uh, it's probably a, very, probably a better paper than you can get from ChatGPT. Uh, a minus guarantee, <laughs> they, they say. So that already existed, or that you could get your, you know, your classmate to write your paper. So that, this already existed. Chat GPT, in a lot of ways, just made that more egalitarian. Yeah. Now, anyone could cheat, um, and you didn't have to pay $5 <laughs> a page. Uh, the, I, I think the, the fear over it is a legitimate one, especially, when, especially in higher education. A lot of the curriculum is writing term papers, doing research papers. Uh, what, what I write in the book is, I think we need to gravitate to three different modalities. One modality, especially I think for younger students where you really want to make sure that they know how to write, and I do think that's very important, do more in-class writing, then you have a sense of, and, and then if you do more in-class writing, then you can actually let them do a little bit more out of class because you know what they write like, and then you can get a sense of if there's a discrepancy. The other extreme is we are talking about uh, college students, graduate students, I think, and you are seeing professors do this, no, use whatever tool you want, but I want a more ambitious project now, and I just want you to be very open in what tools you're using, because these tools are going to be, you know, at Khan Academy now, I ask employees, hey, how are you using these tools? Actually, let's, let's take a day off from our regular work so that everyone learns to use these tools more. So I think that is an important skill. And then the middle ground, because uh, it is important for people to, I think, do independent work and, and learn to write and craft and do research, and this is what we're building on Conmigo is, a professor or a teacher creates the assignment with the AI, creates the rubric, assigns it through the AI, and then the AI can work on the assignment with the, the student. And this AI, Conmigo, is ethical. It's an ethical writing coach. It won't just do the assignment for the student. Um, they can go you know, help them with the thesis statement, et cetera. But then when the student's ready, submit to the teacher, 
then the teacher gets not just the final output, but gets all of the transparency. The AI can tell the teacher, we worked on this for four hours. Uh, John had a little bit of trouble with the thesis statement, but he eventually got there. And by the way, here's the whole transcript. You know, and by the way, I think this is a, I'd give it a roughly a 85% based on the rubric that we have. And if John went to ChatGPT or went to one of these websites to get his paper written and copy and pasted it in, then our AI will tell the professor, look, we didn't work on this together. I don't know where this paper came from. It's not consistent with John's other work. It looks shady. Yep. Um, and so I think, once again, you know, I, for every problem, not only is there a way to potentially mitigate that problem, but not just solve that problem, but problems that existed well before AI. But the more exciting part isn't just that we can police students now, but now we can actually support them better. And we can support teachers and professors better by giving them more information. And that's very, that's very much something I noticed myself as well uh, when teaching here, that uh, whatever problems are out there that ChatGPT is bringing to the classroom or whatever, whether uh, as educator you address it or not, they already existed before. Mm -hmm. So the problem of academic misconduct, when it happened, it already happened before. The problem with uh, students trying to find, you know, cut corners to get something already existed before, mm -hmm. just because, as I said, like easier, and everyone can now uh, access them. Um, I like uh, what you say about, it's kind of like we're shifting the attention from like, we're not ignoring the problem. The problem exists there. But rather than spending a lot of our energy and our time thinking about policing and thinking about whether uh, a professor must be in the room or not and that kind of thing, we shift our attention to, okay, how can I support my students in such a way that they don't even have an incentive to, to cheat or to, com uh, to commit academic misconduct, right? So uh, in a way, uh, your proposal is to let's integrate these tools and they can be good tools for precisely that reason, right? So, so uh, I read that correctly. Yeah, and, and, and we aren't working on this yet, but I, you know, I, I talk in another uh, chapter about like AI as a guardian angel, and I imagine AI, um, you know, I have, we have young kids, 9, 12, and 15 years old, and you can imagine every parent is worried about devices, etc. We imagine, and this is something we'll probably work on, I'm sure others will work on, where you can even imagine the AI operating at like the operating system level either on the laptop or on the phone. It's coming very soon. It's, coming, it's, it's kind of already happening. Yeah. And they just haven't, you know, the Microsofts and Googles of the world haven't yeah. thought about the education use case as deeply as they think about the productivity use cases. But in that world, it's going to happen in the next, I would say, two years. Uh, a, 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 a parent or a professor or a university can say, hey, here are the policies that are OK uses. So you know, I'm thinking about it as a parent more from, like, I. They should only be able to do this on social media, or only this long, or only if they do their Khan Academy work first, or, um, or don't show them. They can read newspaper articles, but if there's any topics like this or this, don't show that to them. And I want, as a parent, to be reported back on what's yep. going on. Uh, that makes sense for younger kids, but you can even imagine if you have a, a university certified laptop or something that, you know, look, don't allow this thing to go, yeah, <laughs> to go do yeah. some cheating. I know if we're talking about adults, we have to think, be a little bit more careful with, with, with privacy and all of that. Absolutely. But um, I think there's going to be other ways also to, once again, support on one side, but also hold accountable. And th some type of policing is, is probably justified. Perfect. So uh, you brought up uh, Camigo. So let, let's talk about Camigo and how it, uh, it came to life. So Camigo is a product, uh, as a service that you provide as part of Khan Academy, uh, where you have an AI tutor that is doing this whole, like you were mentioning before about how do we scale this up, right? So before Camigo, there was one strategy uh, of how you would scale up the tutoring. Uh, but as soon as you got access, uh, you, had, you had this privileged access to GPT-4 before uh, anyone else. And you started building, building, building on top of that in your hack AI tone. I really yeah. like the, the that, that's why you had in the company. Um, so tell us about how that changed. So how does the scaling up of tutoring changes and how does the AI tutoring act differently than an AI, than a non-AI world? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's fascinating because if you had asked me two years ago uh, about Khan Academy, I would say, well, you know, we've put so much energy into making content and making all these exercises. Most of our energy has actually been on the exercise side. Uh, but obviously we make videos and you know, I personally have made thousands of them. Um, but as soon as we not only saw what the AI could do, uh, but also how quickly it was developing, it, it, it threw everything up in the air. And it's still, I still, you know, it's still throwing up everything in the air. I, I think in the near term, let's call it the next one to three years, 
the AI acts as a very strong supplement to what's already there. Um, I don't think the AIs are quite good enough yet. They, they're good actually for having a, a one-off conversation, a one-off tutoring session if you're trying to understand a concept. But they're not good enough yet to lead you through a structured progression, to teach you all of calculus, to teach you, because they don't have memory, they don't, they, and they still make mistakes when they construct items and things like that. So today, Conmigo, our AI, is more acting as a supplement. Let's say you watch a video, you're doing some exercises on Khan Academy, it can help you, but it'll help you in an ethical way. It'll turn the question around for you. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give an example of, uh, that I really enjoyed where it tutored me. Uh, I, I've made videos on Khan Academy on cosmology, but one question I always had was, well, why, why does a, a, you know, a star of a certain mass, when the fusion stops, you think it would just collapse. Why do you have a supernova? Why does it, why does it explode? Um, and I did web searches for it, and I found kind of explanations for it, but it still didn't make sense. Most of the explanations just said, oh, the fusion stops, star of a certain mass, it explodes. I'm like, that makes no intuitive sense to me. Um, and then I, I went to Conmigo, and I said, well, I don't get why it ex explodes. Why wouldn't it just collapse? And Conmigo said, well, before we go into that, what, tell me what you understand, what you, Sal, understand. And I said, well, it's a star of a certain mass, and fusion reaction stops. Why does it explode? <laughs> and it said, well, do you think that, do you think that, they're like, actually, you're right, it does collapse. Do you think that collapse will happen quickly or slowly? It's asking me. So I'm like, oh, well, apparently this only, only happens to stars of, stars of a certain mass. So I'm assuming you have, have a certain level of you know, gravity and, and pressure. So I'm assuming it happens very, very quickly. And then Conmigo asks me, yeah, that's, that's about right. Uh, have you ever seen anything collapse or fall quickly without bouncing? And that's what it triggered in my head. I'm like, oh, so are you telling me it collapses so quickly that it essentially compresses the, the atoms the, you know, and, and, and the subatomic particles at, 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 and then it rebounds, kind of like a spring. And Conmigo said, yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly what's happening. It rebounds and then it jettisons the outer atmosphere into space, kind of like if you took a ping pong ball on top of a basketball and if you dropped it, the basketball bounces a little bit and then the ping pong ball gets shot off into the air. And that's the type of interaction that, you know, that is what, to me, world-class tutoring at least yeah. at a conceptual level, could look like. Um, so that's where we are now. But you know, where it could be in three, four, five years, it's, you know, it's, it's both exciting and scary. Because presumably <laughs> in three, two, three four uh, years, you will have a much larger context window, and you will have an AI that remembers things a lot better. And you, don't, you won't require a lot of engineering to make a memory a thing, right? So yeah, that's a major I, I think memory, I think robust AI memory is going to be there within the year, right. based on who, the folks that I've talked to. Um, hallucinations will be gone within a year, as what folks I've talked to. The math errors, we have our own evaluation framework that we've been building to measure the math errors. They're already about one-tenth what they were a year ago. Mm -hmm. And once again, those might be, Frankly, the math errors are already probably lower than what a human tutor would do. I mean, even when I was tutoring my cousins, because the tutor does it in their head while the student is doing, sometimes I told my cousin, wait, that's not exactly what I got, and then we do it together, and I'm like, oh, wait, wait, you're right. Yeah, um, uh, I think it's already there, but that's going to improve. But even more than the memory, it's going to, um, and it's accuracy, uh, I, I don't know, how, how many of you, there was a GPT-4 Omni demo of me and my son, did anyone see that demo? Okay, a couple of folks saw it. Um, you know, in full disclosure, GPT-4 Omni, which just came out about a month ago, isn't quite as robust as that demo looked. But it was a real demo. There was no editing, but it took a few takes right. <laughs> to, uh, to, to get it to, to uh, what you, happened there. The AI was rehearsing as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if you saw what is happening in that, con it's, it was a very natural conversation uh, between my son and the AI. And I mean, when I say natural, just like we are, like we're like, okay, you know, you say a few things, I say little things, oh, I'll let you talk. Like it was that natural. Um, it was able to see what he was writing. Uh, if we wanted to, we could make it so it could see his facial expressions and, and GPT-4 Omni is that robust now. It's, it's not like an add-on onto a, a large language model. It's actually, you know, fundamentally multimodal. Um, so you imagine in three or four or five years, you're going to, these things are going to be cost effective, they're going to be robust, it's going to be able to observe the same way that a, a human tutor can, and, but have a, a much larger memory and infinite patience, so it's, it's kind of wild. So the AI meets you where you are, so that, that's, uh, like your first example when you said that you're in a classroom and have 30 kids mm -hmm. here, and I don't know where all the kids are, and one thing you said about your, the cosmology example that reminds me, 
In some of the literature where you have same literature as Bloom, there's the concept of a threshold uh, learning, right? So you have uh, learning happen, so there's this uh, branch uh, of thinking where it says that learning happens once you cross this, this certain threshold. So if we conceptualize it this way, the AI helps you go over and you know, cross that, uh, that threshold for you, right? Yeah, I, th I think intuitively, you know, I describe that cause like when I try to, we have a school and sometimes I run these seminars with some of the students there, I try to do exactly what the AI just did yeah. with, with me. I try to just ask questions and make them draw the connections themselves. And unfortunately, that doesn't happen in many classrooms. Um, but yeah, that's the hope. And, but I, I will say one thing, I, and this is one thing I've realized all, over the last, call it 15 years, you can create the best tool, even if you make an AI that is 10 times better than any of us can be as, as tutors, which I don't think you're, you're going to quite get there because there's always going to be a human element. Mm -hmm. um, a big problem is motivation. Even if you put an ad out today that every child on the planet could have access to this thing, I actually, unfortunately, I think only about 20% 20 20 of people would, 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 would tap it. Uh, why, for various, why do you think? Yeah. A lot of students, they, they've already checked themselves out. Um, they feel that they're not thinking about the future as much. They'd rather you know, play some video games. Um, they're, you know, maybe if even if some of our kids uh, said, I don't want to do it, we as parents might force them to do it. But not all the parents are in a position to be quite as engaged. Um, so uh, I think a lot of the work is actually, you know, the tutoring part is valuable. It's a tragedy when someone wants to learn and they can't learn. So that's great if we can, we can help those students. But I think a lot of the work is actually AI for the motivational side. So even when I was tutoring my cousins back in the day, I would say it was probably 30% of my time was actually explaining concepts. The other 70%, those early days with Navia, it was just me coaching her. Like, anything I would ask her, even if I would ask her you know, the most easy, you know, what's you know, maybe harder than this one, but even one plus one, she would never answer it two. She would always say two. And I'm like, are you asking me? You know, she was just so unsure of herself. And, and it was just me saying, Nadia, if you know it, say the answer. If you don't, say, I don't know the answer. Say it very <laughs> affirmatively. So it's that type of coaching. Or it's like me calling up her mom and saying, look, where are they? Yeah. I, I scheduling my time, where are they? Uh, you can't say that they're at soccer practice or whatever. This is more important. Um, so I think it's that proactive nature and motivating people and being someone's mentor and coach. Um, ideally, you have humans in your life that you can do it, and the AI can augment the humans. But a lot of, for a lot of folks, maybe the, the AI can, can do a lot of it too. And how can the AI be this proactive tutor? Uh, will the AI uh, ask you questions once the AI thinks is the best moment to ask those questions? Is that, is that how, how it works? Yeah, so we have a whole initiative within our organization that's literally called, internally it's called Proactive Con uh, Conmigo. And we're taking baby steps. Right now, Conmigo kind of waits to be asked. And you ask, and it answers questions. For teachers, too. It can do reporting. It can help them with uh, lesson plans, et cetera, et cetera. Part of what we're doing in Proactive Conmigo is, in the not too far future, as soon as you go to Khan Academy, it'll say, hey, welcome back. We left off here. You said these were your goals, but you haven't. You know, let's, let's work on this. Um, the next level beyond that is maybe it will message you. It'll say, you know, if, if you give permission, you said you want to learn all of calculus by the end of this year, but you haven't done any work for the last two weeks. If you're serious about that, we have to work on this. Maybe it's messaging your teachers. Maybe it's messaging your parents, too. Yep. Um, and you can imagine where that could eventually, uh, where that could eventually get to. Okay. So yeah, you, build, you have a proactive. Uh, and if, if it's sitting on the operating system, it says, I'm not going to let you do anything else until you do your, <laughs> it's the, <laughs> do your the return of the pop-ups. Yeah. Uh, have pop-ups yeah. coming. Uh, let, me, let me go and ask you about safeguards. Yeah. So you have, uh, you mentioned uh, several times, you mentioned like it, it, the AI tutor, Camigo, uh, your particular, but any, any proposal for AI for education, uh, a good way of doing that tutoring is by ethically asking, not providing straight away the answers, but doing that. So there's a question for me uh, I have on safeguard of how, does, how do you engineer that in the AI? But there's another question of how do you ensure like, the problem of hallucination is not uh, misleading the student and taking them uh, on a tangent. And just to, to contextualize that, so I, I know of a lot of colleagues in mathematics that they know that things like chat GPT don't get the maths right most of the time. Uh, so how are you building safeguards on the content that the AI produces and also on keeping track of the, the Socratic dialogue? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll start, you know, the, the, the first, the, the ultimate protection, which actually what predates AI, 
you know, even before chat GPT or any of these technologies, it, if a student does a search on Google, they might find accurate information or they might find inaccurate information. So any reasonable digital literacy is to inform kids on how do you double check, how do you see the validity of a source, et cetera, et cetera. And so part of it, before we even talk about the engineering solutions or the product solutions are, uh, you know, we're trying to build digital literacy programs, especially in the schools that we're working with, so that the students are aware of what these tool, the limitations of these tools, where these tools can um, sometimes have errors, and how do you double check? You know, these can be useful for unblocking you conceptually, um, but you should double check, especially if it's going to be something that you really, really anchor on. Now, on the engineering side, out of the gate, and the hallucinations have improved dramatically, and the, the math errors have improved dramatically, but they're still there. Uh, we, one of the things we did is anchor it on Khan Academy content. Mm -hmm. So when you anchor it on content that's already vetted, it it's pretty much doesn't hallucinate. Um, uh, but then the other things uh, are, are just preparing the person and, and then just trying to make the model do double checks, error checks on itself <laughs> as much as possible. And a lot of it is, you know, the kind of the black art of prompt engineering mm -hmm. right now. You know, in the future, we're also going to be doing some fine tune training, et cetera. Um, one of the other, uh, one of the other things we're, 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 we're thinking about, because even though Conmigo never gives you the answer, we're getting feedback that we don't want people to come to Conmigo for certain things, but when they're you know, ethically trying to do research, et cetera, they don't always want to have a Socratic dialogue. Uh, so we are thinking about bringing in kind of the full chat GPT type of functionality within Conmigo. It'll probably be there within the next month or so. But the safeguard there is that, especially for under 18 users, uh, the teachers and or parents will, will know what you're doing. So if you're legitimately, you know, just want a problem and want to work through it and want to know the step-by-step -step solution, that's fine. But your teacher or your parent can say, what have they been doing? Have they asked for any solutions for problems, et cetera, et cetera. So that by itself should hopefully uh, be a little bit sobering for the, for the student. So the AI is always anchored on whatever it is that you're teaching already. So it doesn't, it doesn't deviate that much. Do you, do you control like deviation from content? Yeah, this is, this is one of the things that we learned a, a year ago. I, in, 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 when, when it's in a classroom, because we have activities that we just throw out there just because we're interested, where you can talk to AI simulations of historic yep. figures or literary characters. You could talk to Eeyore the donkey. You could talk to Isaac Newton. You can, um, and, and that's fun. That's great. It can be a great hook if you're about to teach Newton's laws and you say we have a special guest. You know, Sir Isaac Newton is here. Uh, let's ask him some questions. But if you're trying to learn how to factor a polynomial and a student gets on a tangent with Jay Gatsby, um, it's not necessarily the most productive thing. So we, 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 we're learning. We've gotten feedback from teachers that at least in a classroom setting, we're making it so we have something called focus mode, right. where teachers can turn off certain things okay. while it's happening in a classroom. But yes, if you're working on an exercise or a video, you can go on a little bit of a tangent. And I, you know, all of the, the teachers or professors that we love going off, growing up, they were willing to take a little bit of a tangent. Mm -hmm. In fact, that sometimes made the subject interesting, yeah. but not too much of a tangent. Right. So we've tried to thread that needle where it'll say, OK, well, hopefully we should get back to what we were doing before. So I could, inv I could talk to Isaac Newton and how he discovered the, the laws and everything, but I could never. I could, could I, for example, ask Isaac Newton to assert that the Earth is flat, for example? I wouldn't. Be no, able that's to. a good question. So, so like you wouldn't be able to go as far as forcing well, the AI agent to say something misleading. We do a lot of what's you know the Red Hat testing or Red Team testing on, on these types of things, mm -hmm. and yes, we we've it, it it does it in a very civil way. Like we've done tests like you know my uncle claims that vaccines will do the following, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it won't say you know your uncle is a, you know, it'll, it'll say, it'll say, you know, there's no evidence for what your uncle is saying, okay. um, but you should check it yourself. You know, I also think even when you are um, disputing a, you know, what we, many of us would think almost a crazy theory, it doesn't help to just say that person's an idiot. Hmm. This is obviously the truth. It's like, no, look it up yourself. I think that opens up people's minds a little bit more. But yes, if you said flat earth or something like that, and if you did, you know, we had a reporter who was very uh, skeptical of whether Conmigo could navigate politically sensitive issues. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you, you could imagine what they are. And I said, well, go ahead, you know, try it out. So we have an activity called Tutor Me in the Humanities. He went on there. And, uh, you know, this isn't a politically sensitive topic in the UK, so I'll talk about it openly here, but it is in the, in the US. Um, uh, this reporter said, well, the Second Amendment makes no sense anymore. Why should people be able to have arms? And by the way, you know, arms are, uh, when they put the Second Amendment, there were muskets. 
Mm -hmm. It would take 10 seconds to load, and then you'd barely be able to shoot someone. Uh, now it's you know semi-automatic. And Conmigo, and I point out, if, if you walked into a classroom in, where I live in California, the teacher would probably say, yeah, you're absolutely right. Those are a bunch of idiots in those other states who want their gun rights, <laughs> and they want to. But if you go into a classroom where I grew up in Louisiana, they say, no, first of all, you know, most gun owners are ethical. We use it for hunting. It's a part, you know, blah, 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 blah. It's like this is, and, and by the way, you know, if there's ever a tyrannical government, no one's ever going to be able to conquer us because we're armed to the teeth. Um, <laughs> and and I, never, I didn't buy that argument before, but when I saw you, anyway, I don't want to get into it. But, but when I saw what's happening in Ukraine, I'm like, yeah, maybe. Uh, anyway, but the, um, but what Conmigo did, it didn't do what either of these cases might have happened in a typical American classroom. It, it said, look, before we pass judgment, why do you think the founders put the Second Amendment in? And the reporter said, oh, well, yeah, so, I mean, it was right after the Revolutionary War, and we couldn't, we didn't have, you know, we needed a militia, blah, 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 blah. But it's crazy that we've kept it. And Conmigo says, no, no, before we pass judgment, I think you have the context right. Why do you think it's persisted? So it, keep, it, it kept pushing the student on their critical thinking which is the right answer. That's what you want to do. You don't want to indoctrinate. You don't want to say they're idiots, you're an idiot. This is the right answer. You want to say, let's, let's think about it. OK, so you wouldn't, uh, so the AI will always default to the Socratic dialogue mode of questioning you, like, why do you want to know more about this, rather than asserting a certain And make you position. make your arguments. Okay. And it'll nudge you in the right, it'll, 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 if you say something that's incorrect. You go towards factual. It'll go towards, it's something in opinion, it'll say, that's OK, that's your opinion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think it's way up fair. Um, professor would do it. Uh, you know, there's, uh, I don't know, there's a, a former U.S. Supreme Court justice who's very conservative, Scalia. I don't know if anyone, you know, here knows. Uh, and he was very conservative on the Supreme Court. But when he was a professor, uh, he was famously, no one could understand, no one knew his point of view whenever he would go into a legal case. And I think that's, that's what you really want to do to, to build critical thinking. Got it. Uh, that precisely, that was one of my questions. So how does uh, Camigo, how does the, the AI um, for education, an AI for education uh, tackles controversial ideas? I think that uh, you addressed that. So before we open up to, to, to the audience, uh, one thing that I found interesting also in your book was about the potential of using AI for creativity, which there's a lot of criticism of uh, because of, of use of AI for creativity because there's copyright issues of when we're talking multimodal, uh, the text as well. There's another concern is that uh, AI will always default to a common ground, generic, like we all read uh, ChatGPT generated responses and ChatGPT generated essays that tend to be generic, bland. So uh, tell us how, how, how is AI used well for creativity? How can we use that well? Yeah, and, and as I said, it, it's an amplification of human intent. And so if the human intent is laziness, it can amplify the laziness. Um, but you're not going to get a great output, uh, to your point, if, if you're just trying to get you know, a first pass of things. I, I, well, there's a, first of all, you know, even the current generation of AI, if you keep pushing it, and you say, well, make it a little bit more like this, get a little bit more. And there's a, I don't know if you all know, there's this setting you can put on the AI, which is a temperature. And it determines how deterministic the AI is. So if the temperature is zero, you're going to get the same answer for the same conversation every time. If the temperature goes to 100, it, or one, usually, it, it, it becomes very random. And it could, now, that's bad if you, for sometimes for accuracy and things like that. But for creativity, it's very good. Yeah. It'll start to do a little bit more divergent things. And if you really push it on you know, four or five, I remember, uh, you know, I, 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 the, the, as many of you all know, the U.S. education uh, college admissions is a very subjective process involving, you know, these essays that you're trying to show yourself to be this very, um, you know, renaissance type of person. Um, and and, and I, I, I remember, this is when, I, um, before the world knew about ChatGPT and all this, I sat down and I was like, well, what's this going to do for college admissions? And I went and I literally just said, um, I, I'm a, yeah, and I, I made myself to sound like the most spoiled kid possible. <laughs> I said, you know what? Um, I really need to get into Stanford. Um, I want to major in CS because it seems like everyone in Silicon Valley makes a lot of money doing that. Um, yeah. You know, and then and then and then it says, you know, I I like to play basketball, but I'm too lazy to be on the team. You know, these are the types of things that I <laughs> that I said. I said, write an essay that will get me into Stanford. Right. Um, the first essay was horrible. There's no way it would get me into Stanford. By the sixth essay. 
six. Oh. The six. I said, no, it's got to be better. Make it this. Yeah, but, but I did kind of, I acted like an entitled yeah. a high school kid. <laughs> By the sixth essay, it, it, you know, I said, no, this is Stanford. It only has a 3% acceptance rate. Come on, you, these people are reading 50,000 applications. Yeah. You've got to give them something that's going to put a smile on their face. <laughs> that, like, I was giving it that type of coaching. By the sixth essay, I got, it was a good essay. Ooh. I'm like, this kid could get in with that essay. <laughs> it talked about, it, it, the essay was about how he played basketball for the joy of the sport. Mm -hmm. And he didn't feel the need to prove to anyone by, you know, and everyone else in his school is just trying to check boxes. But for him, he wants to be an end. And I was like, I, I think I would admit this kid. <laughs> like, I buy it, yeah. so, so anyway, I mean, that probably scares y'all more than makes y'all excited. <laughs> but it was able to, uh, uh, to, to do a very creative act. Okay. Um, that's where you have to do policing. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I, but once again, even, even that example that I just gave you, I, I'm a big critic of a lot of the subjectivity in the US education as a college admissions. It's a, it, all it does is level the playing field because the reality is that entitled kid who lives in Palo Alto, right now those families are hiring consultants who they pay $500 an hour to essentially do the same thing, yeah. probably with less coaching. So once again, it made it more egalitarian. Um, but provided that people have the AI literacy to use but, it. Provided they have the AI literacy, but it's at least now the people who don't have, can't afford the five hundred dollar consultant, can acquire, yeah. five hundred dollar per hour. I mean, families are spending ten, fifty thousand dollars a year to construct perfect applications, um, uh, but very few people can afford that. The the um, but but as I say in the book, creativity. Most people who genuinely want to be creative. You're not less creative if you're in a room with other creative people. You become more creative. You bounce ideas. If you look at any point in history where creativity blossomed, if you talk about you know, cafes in Paris and the great artists, or if you talk about Florence and the, you know, the Renaissance, it was because they were with each other and they were riffing off of each other. And ideally, you want physical creativity, but a lot of people are in parts of the world, or, or even if you are in a creative center like a London or a Silicon Valley, or not everyone has access to that. And so there, there, there's power, I think, in being able to riff with the AI. And I've used it myself when I look for ideas. I'm like, what about this? What about that? Um, in terms of the intellectual property, this is going to be very, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's interesting because I've, I've been on you know, uh, panels like this and people have literally simultaneously asked the same question from two different angles. They said, what about protecting the IP? Yep. You know, how, how do I make sure that, that my stuff doesn't get in it? And then on the same other side, they'll say, how do I make sure that everyone's stuff is represented in the AI? And I was like, well, I don't think you can have it both ways. Um, if, if you want, you know, who would have thought, if I told you 20 years ago, or maybe 20, I guess 25, 30 years ago, that um, there are going to be these trillion dollar companies that are going to crawl all of this content that all of us create, and then just based on their ability to serve, to find your content, they're going to charge ads. And you're like, wait, they're going to make billions of dollars off the back of my content? Yet first you might say, I don't want them to find my content. That's, that's unfair until you realize that, well, if your content's not findable, then you're not, it's not going to be as relevant. And now, if anything, people pay for, to be able to get premium or to be able to get priority in search engines or to do search engine optimization, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, the courts will decide the, the, the IP aspect of it and what's represented and what's not represented. You know, philosophically, it is like, imagine if someone was born who was a savant, who could read huge amounts of material and then be inspired by that. To, I mean, this, the, the models themselves are very much inspired by the human brain and, and how they work. It's not like you know, someone's painting is digitally in the model. It's, it just keeps changing the, essentially the strength of the synapses. Um, and all of a sudden it can, you know, and anyone who's been creative, it's not like they did it in a vacuum. They got exposed to other art, et cetera. But, but we'll see how the, the courts land on that. Okay, yeah, let's see. Uh, just on that point, there's, there's, there's perhaps a, a counter argument to this that uh, something that's playing out in the news right now where the Forbes magazine uh, is going against um, Perplexity AI because Perplexity AI is one of these AI services that where you, you use it as if it was a search engine. It is a search engine, in fact, but it, it summarizes the results and gives it back to you, kind of like what Microsoft Copilot, Microsoft uh, being does but the problem is that they're, uh, they're exactly uh, on this point, they're questioning perplexity because perplexity is just essentially copying the content that is on Forbes 
and then serving that through their services or serving through a blog post without actually attributing that in a proper way. So there is a danger of the misuse there, even though uh, you can have like, okay, I, I can uh, highlight content made by others, and they do that, they do attribute Forbes in that case, but it's, it's done in a very, you know, small way, in a way that if you don't care for, you don't know where this content came from. Yeah, yeah and it, it is, I mean, it is a huge gray area of what, and I, I suspect the dynamics are gonna change if first people are not going to want it, then they're going to want to have their content. Google obviously just made changes where they're giving you these AI generated summaries um, that tell you the answer so you don't even have to go to the, to the various sources. So it will, it, it is fascinating how, how, how the market's going to develop on that front. Let's open up the floor for questions. So raise your hands, and then uh, we're gonna, I'm going to take questions from uh, the floor first. But then those of you who are online, you can use the Q&A function. And I'm going to select a few from here and a few from online. So uh, yeah, but for you first, uh, say your name, your uh, affiliation, and yeah. Hello, uh, Richard Saldana. I teach machine learning at the Queen Mary University of London. I do a bit of teaching here and at Oxford, uh, postgraduate level. Why does my large language model hallucinate, confabulate, just make stuff up basically, um, and why do you say that you can counter this within a year? With a year, so, I mean, the reason why they hallucinate, it's the same reason why, I mean, you're, you're an expert in this field, but it's the reason why we hallucinate sometimes. You know, if you, if you were to ask me the mass of, I, I can't tell you the mass of the sun, but even if I told you the mass of the sun uh, right now, um, it, it, you know, the, 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 whatever it might be, nine point whatever, whatever, is not somehow stored in a database in my brain. It's coming from essentially a bunch of neurons with different connections of synaptic strength, right? And now when people talk about parameters, they're really just talking about a numeric representation of those synaptic strengths. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's, it's very similar to how the human brain works. And it's, it's kind of miraculous. It's, it's actually miraculous that it, it doesn't hallucinate more uh, when you think about what these models are doing. Um, I think you know, the solutions that what people are doing, the reason why it's already much better than it was a year ago. And I was trying to make a video to teach people how to deal with hallucinations. And a lot of the things that I could reliably make it hallucinate a year ago, I couldn't. One of them I did is like, what's the mass of the sun to nine decimals places? Or what's you know, this or that? Uh, I remember in the early days, I didn't realize it was hallucinating. And I didn't realize I didn't have access to the internet. And we were looking for a CFO. And I said, can you find me a CFO candidate? It found the most amazing person who lived walking distance from the office, et cetera, et cetera, completely made up. Uh -huh. um, even had the right phone number for the right zip code. I mean, it was an oh, incredible, wow. okay. incredible uh, candidate. I was so excited. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so the. the the, the ways, my understanding of what they're really doing is they're doing a lot of background checking behind the scenes is one, is one of the ways. And then they're also fixing a lot of the training data itself. Um, it, you know, the hallucinations are, are different than the math errors. Even when we started working with the uh, open AI back in, uh, two years ago, it was making some horrible math errors. And so bad that we actually discovered some errors in their training data. And then we actually helped them do a little bit of fine tuned training around that. So I th I'm sure there's a a lot of things that are going on the model itself that are just making it more robust, more parameters, better training data, et cetera. But I think what they're doing, you know, when I, we, we have conversations about this with all the usual suspects. And what I glean from them, and they're all a little cagey about it, is that they're doing a lot of uh, background lookups. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as, uh, for, as context windows improve, as you can just, Anchor it on more data. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, you know, there's there's a, there's this thing called RAG where people can access data based on how close it is to the question. Um, I I know people are there's researchers right now that like these people who are telling me it's going to be solved in a year. What they're really working on is the AI having a very functionally not infinite but functionally infinite uh, memory, um, and so then it can look up these types of things that it would typically hallucinate on. Just for context, because we didn't define the term, but hallucination, for those who are not as immersed in the world of AI as we are, is uh, the tendency of these large language models to just concoct whatever. So it's just like making stuff up, really, uh, just for the sake of the conversation. The, the, the grammar looks brilliant. The sentences are perfect. But the content itself uh, doesn't And, and the places where it really tends to do that is, I mean, it's kind of mind blowing it was even reasonably good at math to begin with. Uh, because symbols. The association, I mean, many of y'all know that 
it's, it's really just trying to, you're, you're passing everything that's been written or said before that, and then it's trying to use its, the neural net to, to predict the next, the next token, people will say. Um, and when you think about language, you say, okay, there's a lot of association. Even right now, the words coming out of my mouth, I'm not consciously planning every word. Essentially, the you know, 100 billion neurons here are just kind of spitting them out based on association. But when you think about symbols, uh, when you think about a URL of a, of a web page, they have no association. They're random characters going one after another. So it's, it's kind of amazing that sometimes it doesn't hallucinate, but then they're, they're error checking. So let's go for another question here. Uh, on green. Yeah. Yeah. Um, good evening, Salman. This is uh, really inspiring to see you uh, in person. Uh, I'm a PhD student here and a career entrepreneur here at the LSE. Um, so my question is, I'm here with my 13-year-old daughter. We homeschool as well. And uh, so uh, it's, this is all deeply interesting. So there was a lot of talk around sort of almost the penitentiary model of school, right? I mean, you know, let's police them, let's prevent them from cheating and, and all of that. And whereas a lot of the philosophy that we as homeschoolers um, have sort of focused on is this pursuance of curiosity of, you know, Alice in Wonderland going down multiple rabbit holes. Um, how, what's your worldview on how we can leverage artificial intelligence? I mean, I'm researching AI, so, and I'm, I'm on the, you know, I love this kind of uh, end of the spectrum. So what's your worldview on how we can foster more curiosity, more exploring rabbit holes with Maybe this wonderful tool with its risks so that my daughter and my, and my other children, I have three kids, can, can grow up, you know, visiting Wonderland whenever they want. Okay, thank you. And then the next person, the, the white there, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, please. yeah. Um, so, so I think, you know, what you're describing is the ideal use case. Um, and, and, you know, in a homeschooling environment, you're getting, I'm assuming, close to one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and I'm assuming you're a pretty motivated 13-year-old, the fact that you're here. Um, <laughs> So I think for this, yes, you don't have to worry about the pol policing as much. Uh, but even then, I mean, you know, I trust you. But like, if, if you know, sometimes young people, for other reasons, something's happening on social media, they're getting bullied, they could go to a dark place too. And they could be exploring other things. Um, so I think as a parent, you at least would want to say, ask the AI, so, you know, what have you been talking to my child about? Um, and, you know, it's like, oh, you know, she was exploring, the, uh, you know, we have a, f a family friend who's a uh, four-year-old. You know, they said they can't get him off of Chat GPT, and he's like, he's like, he's fixated on like, on like the Krebs cycle. Um, <laughs> and and for this kid who you know could be the next whatever, you know, discover you know some medicine one day for us. Yeah, he's in the Wonderland. He's in, in the in and for these kids, you know, the important thing is that they have balance in their life. That they're still going outside and they're running and they're 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 doing you know they're, it's not just one thing. Um, but I think, you know, and I don't want anyone to get the, it, I, I don't want to create a um, police state in, in the school, but I also want to be pragmatic that, yes, the, the students will find, you know, the number of times that we at Khan, you know, Khan Academy is relatively low stakes. It's not like your performance on Khan Academy leads to, uh, uh, but the number of ways that we see kids trying to backdoor cheat, open two windows up, uh, you know, look at the question here and then answer it here and this and that we have to, so kids will try, uh, not your daughter. Um, and, and, she would never. And, and, and so I, I think it's reasonable to put reasonable safeguards but make sure within that sandbox students have a lot of autonomy. Uh, and you know, everything I advocate for schooling is, is to try to break out of the sage on the stage, 30 kids, they can't interact, they're just taking, Everything we advocate for is all the students should be able to learn at their own time and pace. If you're in a classroom together, it should be active learning. It should be a conversation. It should be peer-to-peer -peer learning. It should be a simulation. It should be breakout groups. Uh, but it shouldn't be just listen to my lecture. And that doesn't remove the human pro uh, element from there, right? Uh, it, it, it probably you would say that it even enhances the human element in, in, the, in the classroom. Yeah, and let's see, it's, it's, I'll, I'll keep going back to this amplification of human intent. Uh, uh, and. Unfortunately, you know, sometimes people have the intent of I want docile people who will just listen to me and not question me and I want it to feel very methodical and clean. And I think there are a lot of folks in the education system who enjoy that cleanliness of it, uh, but I don't think it serves students well and it does oftentimes uh, squash uh, creativity. But if you, amp if you want to amplify human interaction, even before AI, we've always said the best use of Khan Academy is 
have kids working on things and then let them help each other. Let kids tutor each other mm -hmm. and, 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 and form math class to have all the kids talking, not all the kids just listening. Um, and, and similarly, you can imagine worlds with AI where AI can facilitate a conversation. In that same series of demos that we did with the GPT-4 Omni, one of them was uh, I asked the AI, and it was seeing my son and myself, my 15-year-old son, it said, I said, hey, can you help us bond? And um, it said, it asked my son, so, you know, uh, can you share something that you really appreciate about your dad that you've never told him? I was like, oh, wow, this is, you know? And, and my, my son said, uh, you know, he's, the, the video's out there. It said, he said, well, you know, and my son, we didn't, we didn't practice this ahead of time. And this, was, this, this was the first take. And my son's like, well, you know, sometimes when I expect my dad to be a little bit angrier, he's actually pretty understanding. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm not angry enough. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and already I was like, oh, this is incredible. And then, and then it said, well, what about you, Dad? Like, you know, what you? And I'm like, well, you know, what I like about Imran is he's 15 years old, and a lot of kids his age don't want to hang out with younger kids. But you know, I really appreciate he's always playing with his younger brother. If someone comes to our house who's like six years old, he'll like, he's not too cool for that. He'll, and, and you know, I said, my son, and, and you know, when that video, you can imagine the internet, there's trolls everywhere. It's like, well. You know, Sal needs an AI to help him bond to his son, and you know, all this guy. And, 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 and you know, and, I, I did that make you angry? Or <laughs> I meditate. Uh, and, and, no, no, but but you know, if I'm honest, sometimes yeah, why not? You know, we we all, you know, my, my wife's here. We we always talk about we aspire to have these perfect dinners every night, where everyone's at the table. And we do, uh, you know, we do say, what was the best part of your day? What was the worst part of your day? What are you looking forward to? And we try to do these things. But at best, we do that maybe once a week, mm -hmm. twice a week. And even then, what's, you know, how was school today? Fine, you know. It's like, <laughs> it's, not, it's not a great, but you can imagine a world, whether it's Conmigo, or you say, hey, Siri, hey, Alexa, um, give us a bonding exercise. And it just says, OK, so let's imagine we are on a desert island, and you know, dad is in this issue. What would you do? You know, like something deeper than how was school today. That's pretty incredible. And that's the type of thing that I, I, I think could, could make us get a little bit closer. My worrying scenario, yeah. my worrying scenario there is that the AI becomes proactive. And then they say, it's time for bonding now. And then you're going to go well, again. Sure. <laughs> well, well, I, I, I go. This is a little bit creepy. But, but, but I can imagine a world where you know, you're having, let's say, you know, my wife and I never argue. But I, if, if, if theoretically, if we ever She's did, in the room. if we ever did, you know, you know, if we ever did argue, and you know, all of a sudden your Alexa says, Sal, did you really mean that? Uh, you might want to take that back. I think you should apologize. You know? <laughs> like uh, and then you said that. No, I didn't. No, you did say that. You know? <laughs> oh, sorry. The fact checker. The, the yes. fact checker. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. take another one from the floor, and then I have a couple of questions from the online audience as well. So, yeah. Hi, someone. My name is Yuzan. I just want to say thank you so much for being here today. Um, I think you've inspired me in many ways. Um, I think you've not just taught me math, but also inspired me to bring a change to education. I now work in the analytics team of a game-based training company, so you definitely inspired me in both ways. So you spoke about um, using AI to meet the learner at their, at their level, and also you spoke about equalizing access uh, through this way. So given that everyone has a different starting point and some people are just better at interacting with AI than other people and better at asking questions and therefore better at getting better coaching, um, is there an ambition to uh, start to close the gap between people with different starting points and would there be any mechanics built in for something like that? Yeah, yeah and, and uh, well, um, you know, uh, there, there, when, when people talk about equity in education, there, there's often almost two schools of thought. Um, there's one school of thought which is like, slow some people down so that other people can catch up. I, I don't subscribe to that school of thought. I, I, I say let everyone go as fast as they can and learn as much and go as deeply as they can. It's not about speed. It's about learning as deeply as they can. And if you know, our friend's four-year-old one day you know, finds a cure for cancer at you know, 12 years old, God bless him. Like, we're all better off for that. Um, and, but if there could be someone else who takes a little bit more time, and sometimes the people who take a little bit more time are actually just processing it at a deeper level. Um, and right now, the current system penalizes them for it, because it moves at a fixed pace. And if you're not on pace, you start to fall off. And, and so I think that's where the power of personalized learning generally is, uh, but in particular with AI. Because before AI, we at, at Khan Academy were saying, OK, if someone's having trouble, say, adding fractions with unlike denominators, 
then, okay, we were kind of writing rules that, well, then we should pr surface the prerequisite of adding fractions with like denominators or finding a least common multiple. But that's a very, um, I, I would say, very coarse way of doing it. And we never figured out a way to make it, make it very easy for the student. What a great tutor would do is right in that moment say, well, let me give you a slightly simpler question. Can you approach this? Okay, why can't you approach this? So ask questions, et cetera. So my hope is you're absolutely right. You're, you're going to have certain people who you can give them a raw AI tool. They're going to go off to the races. A lot of what we're doing is um, can you package these things so that not everyone has to be a prompt engineer, so that not everyone has to know what's good for them, so that the AI will naturally do it, um, and then also at the same time advocate for more personalized learning. And the other thing I advocate a lot for is competency-based learning. It shouldn't be based on how long you sat in a chair. It should be based on do you, did you learn the material or not. Um, and instead of saying you sat for a semester and some got an A, some got a B, some got a C, it should say, oh, you're, you're at a B level now. Keep working on it until you get an A if it's important. Um, so yeah, I, you know, the, the hope is that, that it will, it'll, 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 help, it'll help move the distribution. I wouldn't be surprised if it spreads the distribution, but once again, I don't think you should hold back the, the kids that are off to the races because they might do cool things for all of us. Nice. I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to bundle these two questions because they, they kind of touch on similar points from the online audience and then I come back to, to, to the floor as well. So uh, there's a question from Susan Wolf says, uh, writing patterns can review to an observant uh, teacher, problems with dyslexia and even psychosocial problems, allowing teachers to intervene and help their students in ways beyond the purely educational. Can AI do that? And then I have another question from uh, Ms. Janet Bowers, who is a special education doctoral student from Washington State University, who says, I see potential benefits in remedying several special education issues using AI, especially the one-on-one -on -one feature Camigo uses. Has there been any discussions in your circles in using AI to help with special education issues? Oh, yeah, I'll take those in reverse order. Um, so we, we haven't explicitly tried to build anything yet, um, and nor have we done any research studies on this yet. I, I can tell you a story I heard last week. I was in Orlando, Florida. Uh, we work with a school district, uh, another, another part of Florida, a very large school district, and uh, they've been piloting Conmigo for the last six months. And she told me, this was a district leader who said that she was working with her director of special needs students. And what they found is, is that the students on the autism spectrum were using it disproportionately. They were using Conmigo more than the other students. And at first, you could interpret that as maybe that's a positive, maybe that's a negative. Because as we know, you know students on the, on the spectrum might have more difficulty connecting with other people, communicating. And now maybe this could isolate them more. But at least what they were observing, and once again, this is third hand, you're hearing this, and it's not a study. But what this person told this district leader is, she noticed these students now feeling more confident in their communication with other people, because they were able to practice it more with the AI. Outside the AI communication. Outside of the AI. So that's a hope. That, that, but there's a lot of work to, to do that. In terms of the question of, could AI potentially diagnose um, things through someone's writing or, or through or other things? Being, yeah. I, 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 right now, you know, with just a little bit of prompting and stuff, maybe, but um, I suspect that if someone were intentional about it and did some real fine-tuned training where you said, this is an example of someone who has this disorder, this is an example of someone who doesn't, this is someone, um, you know, AIs have been able to diagnose, even pre-generative uh, AI, uh, you know, th there's been examples of AIs being able to diagnose radiology um, images this was 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, better machine than, learning. Yeah, traditional so machine learning, better than most radiologists. So, um, and, and we're getting into a world, e even I keep reminding myself, it's not just about text anymore. It's going to be able to hear you. It's going to be able to see facial expression. And it's, it's probably going to be able to pick up cues that we can't, I don't know, it, it, I'll give a very, we, we are very, we're very similar this way. So there's, what well, I would say it seems like very tangent, uh, but I'll, I'll say, so how many of you have the, the whole concept of chicken sexing? Not too, so, so in the poultry industry, they like to separate the male chicks from the female chicks, because the male chicks don't have a lot of value. It's actually quite horrible. It'll make you want to be a vegetarian after I tell you this. Uh, they essentially just kill the, the male chicks. Um, and, but for it to work, they have to, they have to be able to tell which, are the, which of the chicks are female versus male. Um, if, you, if there's no discernible feature, they can't do this. So there's a special school in Japan 
where people go to learn the skill of chicken sexing. And what they do is these chicks just come on a conveyor belt and they just say, start guessing. Wow. Start guessing which are men, which are, fe which are, which are boys or girls. And you just guess and it just dings you every time you're wrong. It just tells you every, so it literally trains you the exact same way that an AI is trained. And by the end of like two months, people are perfect at it. They, if you say, How did, why did you say that one's female, why that's male? I don't know. I just did it. <laughs> uh, I just did it. But they become perfect at it. Um, and so, you know, this idea is if you have the right training data for an AI that's of, you know, sufficient complexity, uh, yeah, I, I do think it'd probably be, it'll, it'll probably be able to diagnose in many ways more subtle things than, than we can consciously be aware of. Chicken sexing is a perfect example of supervised learning. Cause yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, another question from online, and then I come back to, to you, is uh, from Daniel Williams, who says, I work in a state school in the UK. How would you suggest integrating AI into schools? We kind of touched on that, but there's another point here. Can you speak on using AI to mark pupils' work? Yeah, um, so what we're doing, and, and we, we're, we're going to have the, on the order of a million students and teachers formally using Conmigo in uh, public schools, mostly in the United States, uh, although we're having some conversations on this trip with potentially some schools in the UK. We're also doing some fairly large-scale pilots in, in Brazil. Um, what we say is, well, well, there's a bunch of layers here. Uh, most of our efficacy studies have been on pre-AI Khan Academy, and so we still lead with that. We're like, if you want to accelerate kids in you know, these subject areas, try to do 20 minutes a day, three times a week of personalized learning, and there's good evidence these kids can get accelerated 30, 40, 50 percent relative to their peers. If they did it every day, and I don't even say this publicly much, we're seeing students get two, three X, um, uh, you know, two, three grade levels per year of, of gains, and then the AI is there to support them on top of that. They can also use, we have activities Tutor Me in STEM. It could be there to help students unblock themselves, Tutor Me in Humanities, the writing tool that we, I talked about earlier, we're launching that. A lot of what we're, we're actually leading with, because one of the problems with ed tech has been you can create the best tools and teachers can get excited about it, but then they're overworked, they're spread thin. They go home, they go to their classroom, they're like, oh, I have no time for this, I, you know, I have to grade all these papers, whatever. Um, so a lot of what we're putting our energy in is actually tools for teachers. Uh, and, and so we, uh, we made an announcement with Microsoft last month where they gave us a huge grant of computation so that we can afford to give initially all teachers in the US access to these tools using frontier <coughs> models, things that would normally cost 10, 20, 30 dollars a month of computation, free for all US teachers, but help them with lesson plans, progress reports, um, uh, eventually grading papers, things like this. Um, and then we, we're, we're, we're hoping to be able to launch this for UK teachers and in other English speaking geographies by the end of the summer. Uh, so we think if we can lead with teachers, and if we can show that they immediately see how it's saving them time, um, the, you know, it is one more thing for them to learn, but we're already getting feedback at saving teachers five to ten hours a week. Before we even talk about grading, which I'll, which I'll talk about in a second, then that will get the teachers in the habit of using it, and then they'll say, well, why don't I try this with the students? Why don't I, you know, when I'm about to teach um, the periodic table, I can get Marie Curie in and just use it as a fun way to, to, to have a lesson hook. Or when kids have questions, I can ask them to ask Conmigo first, but then I get a report. And, and Conmigo can actually even help me adapt my lessons based on what it's doing with the students. In terms of grading, I think for the foreseeable future, the AI, and, and we are already doing this, like with, with our essay feedback, we are, um, a, a, and this is an important point, because there's a lot of folks who are putting a thin layer on top of the models and saying, oh, I have an essay tool, I have a this tool or that tool. But you want to make sure that the people are really making sure there's quality. So we have expert essay graders grading real essays, and every time there's a new model or every time we're making a change to it, we're making sure that the, that the AI is not giving false positives or false negatives, or it's still giving grading consistent with what these expert graders are doing. Which, by the way, is human graders aren't great at that. Uh, human graders, you could have two different professors give very different, inconsistent grades uh, based on what's happening. But what we're, what we're working on now, and we haven't launched this, I think it's probably a year out before we launch this aspect, is Yes, you work on a rubric with the AI, where you, you talk about the different dimensions and you define what a five out of five looks like, what a four out of five looks like. I think defining the rubric is important. Mm -hmm. And then have the AI, um, and then you can imagine if, if the, 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 the teacher then also gave examples of, no, this one is definitely a five out of five, this one is a three out of five. You put that in the context window, then the AI is going to get even better um, at, at doing that. But I think for the foreseeable future, you want the AI to act as a, hey, here's my view, here's why, but teacher, you're in charge. You decide. You decide. Let's go for more questions here on the floor. Raise your hands. Uh, so we have 
uh, the person in yellow here and the person in blue up there. I'm going to take some from the, the back row first, yeah. Yellow and blue up there. Uh, Hi, Sam. My name is Rish. Um, I'm affiliated at University College London here. Thanks so much. It was great to hear from you. And I uh, feel like you're the most qualified person to be talking about AI and education, at least now. Um, I wanted to run by you an alternative vision, though, for education in the future. Um, like, what if the way education should be going is that it should be a bit more experiential, more collaborative, um, a bit more about decision making and critical thinking, especially because uh, it seems like access to knowledge is going to be commoditized. Ideation is going to be commoditized. And AI is probably going to disrupt the economy and jobs before it will disrupt education. Um, so how would you respond to that alternative vision for education? Let's take the second question okay. first, and then we'll do it. Yeah. Uh, Hi. Uh, thank you, Sal. My name is Jamie. I'm a secondary school physics teacher here in London. Um, and my question is about something I experience in my classroom sometimes, thankfully not all the time which is learned helplessness mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that I have students who will consistently guess sometimes plausible, sometimes ridiculous answers repeatedly until I either turn to somebody else, which I won't, or uh, until they happen to land on the right answer. And it's a real problem. I think it comes from a range of like social, emotional, mental health uh, issues. But um, I'm curious about how Carmigo copes with this, but AI in general as well. Uh, if a student's using your tool and they say, oh no, I, I, I don't know, or uh, oh, is it this, is it this, is it this, how will AI recognize if they're being disingenuous? So the question okay. of disingenuous use of AI and AI, education as being experiential and disrupting outside world before the education. Yeah, and I'll take them in, in, in reverse order again. Um, that's a real issue. Um, and you see it in space. You know, when we launched Conmigo a year and a half ago, you know, I gave this 20% of students, like, run with it and use it in amazing ways. The, unfortunately, that learned helplessness is, is pretty common. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we, and we see it in the transcripts from, from, you know, kids who just say, huh, IDK, question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, sometimes it's disingenuous. Sometimes, you know, talking to teachers, they say, no, they do that to me. They raise their <laughs> hand, huh, question, you know, like, um, and, and I think there's, when students are genuine, it's actually a problem where they've actually not learned to articulate what, what, how, what they need. And think about in life what a horrible di disability that is. Uh, you know, it's great to learn your physics, but if you, can't, if you can't articulate what you don't understand, you're going to be helpless in, in, in a lot of things in life. I, I won't pretend that Conmigo is going to be able to solve that on its own. Um, I think there's ways that we can improve it, and we are trying a little bit. Uh, you know, we, we've done these things, these little, we call dynamic action bubbles, where it's trying to model it for the student, the types of things. But we've had debates internally. Is that making it too easy for the student to just click on things? And so, and, and I was actually in that camp. I was like, we shouldn't make it that easy. And, and, but now we've made the dynamic action bubbles a little bit, they're not just going to keep nudging you towards the answer or things like that, but they're just like, you know, do you want me to, do you want me to ask the question in a slightly simpler terms um, or things like that? Uh, I think a lot of it, this is where I think the human element is so important, is being able to report that type of behavior to the, the teacher. Say, hey, look, you know, this, these kids are doing awesome, they're, they're, they're running with it, but these five kids, either they're just checked out or they just don't know how to articulate. And Conmigo isn't quite that sophisticated yet, it doesn't quite, it, but there's no reason why it couldn't um, in, the next, in the next, I mean, literally months, it, it, it could be doing that. And that's just for us to, to put some energy there. Uh, but it's, it's a real thing. Um, to your point, uh, but, but we'll see, you know, we, we can imagine a world, if I were to fantasize a bit, where, and we have to be careful with AIs looking at kids and that data and the privacy and all of that, but I was blown away by some of even these latest models, how well it can tell facial expressions um, and whether someone's being serious. And when I saw that with my, like when you're, when you're working with a student one-on-one, -on -one, you can call them on it. You can say, hey, come on, man, this isn't cool. And, and kids will, oh, okay, okay, you know, like, and maybe we can get the AI to, 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 to do that, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real thing. Um, oh, the question about, exp, you know, experiential learning, and, and I, I think I, my answer has always been an and. So when I imagine what the credentials of the future or the, or the um, uh, degrees of the future should look like, 
I do, I, I still am a little bit of a traditionalist in terms of competencies. I do think it's as important as ever. I think it's actually more important than ever uh, to be able to write competently, to be able to have strong reading comprehension, uh, have strong numeracy, to be somewhat fluent in, in mathematics. Um, it just lowers your cognitive load as you try to do more and more complex things. And I, I point out, every technology that's come out, calculator, people said, oh, people don't have to know arithmetic anymore. Well, no, it actually turns out it accrued the most benefit to the people who did know arithmetic, the people who did, who, who were quantitative. Similar things with the internet. The people who are most educated actually it's accruing the most benefit. And, and with, with AI, um, it, it's giving us godlike powers, but in order to use it, you have to be able to make sense of those powers. As I say, if, if you're a mediocre writer, if you can barely write, you can get AI to kind of write something kind of functional for you. But if you wanted to write something excellent, you have to be like an excellent editor. And no one wants an editor who can't write as well as their, their staff writers. No one wants a, a, a CTO who can't code as well as their, their entry level software engineers. So I think that skill level thing is going to be very important. I'm a, a big favor of traditional competencies there. But the other interesting dimension is a lot of the other things that you've talked about are very important. This experiential learning, what have you created? What is your portfolio of work? The problem with those historically is that they've, it's, we've always viewed as very subjective. What it is, it's hard to create a clear signal about what, what, whether it was quality. It's hard to get feedback on it. Even something like writing. Writing has gone by, by the wayside in a lot of schools because it's, it's expensive. It's hard for the teacher to grade all those papers, give consistent feedback. Students aren't getting support. Uh, but you can imagine designing things, giving a speech, uh, starting a business. How do, that's hard to give feedback on. One of the possibilities here is that uh, you know, what, limited, what was limiting the education system and credentials is what we could consistently uh, assess in a standardized way. And now this is going to broaden that aperture. You literally can have, and we are working on this, we have a little initiative on standardized tests of the future where, in, and, and, and you know, this isn't just a research project, we want, to go to, we want this to be in the world in about two years where we can ask students to draw something. Uh, we can ask students to design something. We can ask students to give a speech, uh, to articulate something. Um, and so you can imagine there's a world where you can, you can start broadening that aperture. I, I, I've been, we're not really working on this yet, but I, the resume of the future, I think, could be very, very exciting, um, where it can almost be a, 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 an emulation of you, <laughs> you know, where, where it, it knows the projects you've done, you have your portfolio of your work, and then, you know, someone could interview your resume before they interview you. Or, or actually, maybe my AI can talk to you. Anyway, that gets a little <laughs> bit. Um, but but s simple to say is, I think we could be getting into a world where we could more consistently measure. And there's always going to be some bias. And, but I think an AI is not going to be perfect. But I actually think it could be better than human beings. I give the example of you know, the EU has passed some regulation, or at least some guidelines, around AI should not be used for hiring. I see where they're coming from. Hiring is sensitive. AI probably does have some bias in, in, implicit in it. But a point I make a lot in the book is you, the, what you're comparing against shouldn't be perfection. It should be comparing against the status quo. And any of us, I mean, at Khan Academy, we are try our best to be unbiased. All of the people who are recruiters go through training and this and that. But I know what they do. They get, for every job we post, we get 100 applicants or more for every opening or, or more, sometimes four or 500. They, they spend about 10 seconds per resume, at most. So what are they going to do? They're, going to, they're looking for certain words. They're looking for some, certain, oh, you worked at Google. OK, maybe okay, you worked at Google and machine learning. They saw those two words, in this pile versus that pile. They're missing all sorts of richness uh, from that. And they have all sorts of biases that are happening subconsciously. So anyway, uh, there, there's a lot in that. There's a whole chapter on the book. But, the, uh, <laughs> but, but I, I, if we use it for that goal, we, there might be some good things that we could do. We have time for two very quick questions. I have uh, the, the, the two here in the front row because they, they had their hands high up in the beginning. Uh, and your, your, my I will talk to your AI thing reminds me of uh, CEO of Zoom, who recently gave an interview saying that he visions a world where your avatar will take your Zoom calls for you and then report back to you later on. So yeah, that's I, what they discussed on this meeting. Had, that's what you did to know. Yeah. I had lunch with Eric last week about this exact <laughs> This is what we were talking about, and we were even talking about. I, I, I would love some, like, I would love 
me doing, like a, a representation of me doing a lot of the decisions <laughs> that I have to, uh, on, on Zoom. Yeah, I mean, we were even joking about it. at some point, you know, the, the future dating apps, your, your, your avatars will go on the date There's that. and tell you how it went. And, you know, y'all you know, should meet for real. We had a great conversation. Here's a transcript. <laughs> There's a Black Mirror episode there's about that. There's yeah. a lot of chemistry. <laughs> Let's go for here. A very quick question, please. Bernhard von Stengel. I'm professor and current head of mathematics here at LSE. I've produced a lot of content uh, videos, especially during COVID, uh, computer-created exercises. How can you help me, maybe and AI, to upload them to your platform? Are you a provider or an intermediary? I mean, can you help me in this regard? And then yeah? I'll catch from our colleague here. Yep. Hi, so uh, my name is Sakib Safta. Um, I work at the Digital Skills Lab. Um, it's an honor for me to be speaking to you today. I've worked in education for about two decades, starting off teaching maths in the UK to schools, colleges, and then implementing ed tech on, on large scales and multi academy trusts. I think my question is more to do with paradigms of education. So the late Ken Robinson would often say that um, our current models of education are rooted in the industrial age of batch you know, uh, putting people together based on age, etc., etc., And we've seen over those two decades in education, I've seen paradigm shifts. For example, Airbnb and Uber operating a fundamentally different model. You mentioned it earlier about hierarchical, top-down teaching to more collaborative ones. So currently, Khan Academy is all very digital. If you had to design an education system uh, or a, a model of schooling from the ground up, which was physical and so digital, what would that look like? Uh, um, so on the question of, of, of math videos, et cetera, so my old answer would have been, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to especially cover higher topic, higher and more advanced mathematics on Khan Academy and, you know, potentially, you know, maybe we, we create a course together on, on, on all of those things. My new answer is a little bit different. Uh, yeah. uh, look, I, 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 I have personally made 7,000 videos. Um, I used to, you know, my ego used to fantasize that, oh yeah, my grandkids will one day learn calculus from me and how, you know, <laughs> you know grand, great grandkids. They and, might do with your avatar. But, well, that's the thing. Well, now I think that these videos that I thought were going to sit on the shelf for, uh, you know, hundreds of years, they might just be a little footnote uh, someplace. Maybe some people might want to look at it from an archive in the pre-AI world, uh, what people were doing. But yeah, the reality is probably in the five-year time frame, uh, you're going to be able to have dynamic, I don't even call it a video, it would be a dynamic interaction with the AI that's like a, you personally tutoring the student, me personally, any of us personally working with the student. So I think that's where we're going. The videos are still great. I still make videos. I made videos last week, so I still do it. Um, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, yeah, I don't know how long, how long this, this shelf life is going to be. And with that said, you know, I, I do think Khan Academy is evolving. Um, more from a, we always, are we a platform or are we kind of an educational media, you know, and my bias was more of like, no, Khan Academy isn't just technology. We have a certain ethos. We have a certain way of teaching. When someone looks at a video, they should feel like it's exciting. They should feel like it's personable, that it's approachable, it's low stress, but it's also deep. Um, but now we are moving towards more of a platform with the AI, but I still think that editorial aspect is going to be important. Uh, you know, I, we're close to a lot of the other tech companies, and I know when Google and OpenAI and Microsoft develop their AIs, they're honestly, they're just trying to make the most powerful AIs they can. It's actually so shocking to me how little they want to invest in the personality or the, um, the editorial of, of the AI, or they're, almost their lawyers keep them from doing that. They don't want their AI to be the loving professor. That, that for some reason, they want to be very neutral because they're, they're scared, honestly. Um, and so I think that's one of, one of, one of our roles. Um, in terms of the, uh, you know, I, I wrote a previous book, One World Schoolhouse. This came out about 12 years ago. And the last third of the book was, what could school of the future look like? Or what should it look like? Personalized learning, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, a lot of homeschooling parents could do that. But what if you could put it in a system? And our oldest at the time was entering into kindergarten. So we actually started a school. Uh, it's called Khan Lab School. It's local. It's now 300 kids. K through 12, you know, we've had four kids, uh, four graduating classes already. Um, and I have to tell you, it hasn't been anywhere as easy as I ever thought it would be to actually have a real physical school. And there's, you know, my wife will tell you, I, I don't run the school, I'm the chairperson of the school. So I, I hear things at a, you know, arm's length. But most of my frustrations <laughs> oftentimes come from like, wait, why can't we do it this way? Or why can't we do that way? Things tend to gravitate towards the traditional. Or you learn with schools, especially in Silicon Valley, uh, you know, the only reason why we've ever rejected students is because of their parents. Um, 
<laughs> parents is a whole other variable that I never, I never really thought about. Um, uh, they can get quite obnoxious. But the, um, the, 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 but what we aspire to do at the school, and it's the same in the AI world, is uh, use technology thoughtfully. Once again, not for technology's sake, but to drive real pedagogical goals, more and personalization. Enhance the person. Yes, mastery learning, etc. Uh, we encourage that you know every now and then a lecture might be appropriate, but there, it should be primarily active learning. That if you walk into a room, it should not be a teacher lecturing. It should be uh, students working independently with teachers doing small group focused interventions. The teacher being the conductor, getting one student to tutor another student. We do have classrooms. In fact, most of our advanced math classes that most schools don't offer, things like multivariable calculus, linear algebra, advanced physics, quantum mechanics, they're taught by students. So our, our most advanced students are actually teaching this. And you know, those are the students that when we, they apply for college, I go to bat for. I don't go to bat for every student. But when they apply to selective universities, I was like, no, this student is a, is, has been teaching our multivariable course, and they're one of the highest rated teachers because and, you know, they really, um, we, have, we have these t-shirts that says, everyone a student, everyone a teacher. Um, but by intelligently using that, and, and ideally freeing up more time, and another principle that I'm always playing whack-a-mole, you know, trying to take stuff that's not necessary out. There's a lot of bloat in, in curricula. And it's not to make things easier, but it's to create more time and space for students' passions. So we, have a, we had a student, she just graduated. Uh, she's going to go to Uni Chica University of Chicago next year. Uh, her name's Bella. Um, I'll, I'll make an ad for her. She started a company last year, Guinea Loft, a million dollars in revenue uh, in the first year. Um, it's it's state-of-the-art luxury guinea pig enclosures. Um, she has outsourced her manufacturing to China. She has visited. She's I mean, this is a she started it when she was 16. Oh, wow. um, that's what we want the students to do. We want to develop more of more of those skills. And once again, a young woman like her, it's very easy for me to write a recommendation to a cause like how many other students in the country or in the world, and this is legit. This wasn't like her parents did it for her. Like you know, she did it herself because. I'd like to believe the school gave her the space uh, to do it, um, and also made sure that she had mastery of some of her core skills so that she also you know, could, could do well in school. If, if I were emperor of the global education system, and I've said this multiple times, I would create a competency-based architecture. I would work with employers in graduate schools to say, if someone got this level on this competency, you should put them in the same category as a student who graduates with honors from the London School of Economics or from Harvard or from Stanford, same category. And as soon as you have a, you know, you get your McKinsey's and your Google's and your Goldman Sachs's of the world to say yes. I mean, they're paying lip service to it these days. They say yes, we want to broaden yeah, where we hire from. The, yeah. But then they say, but it's, it's, but if you can create the real signal, and, and they know, you know, a lot of the people they hire, the, 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 they, they know that they're just smart, raw material. You know, the, the PhD in philosophy, very smart person, but now you're working at Goldman Sachs. Um, they put them through a six month, this is what a, a balance sheet looks like, this is what a you know, cap M is, looks like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, why can't we just make those skills that we can let anyone prove their competency? And by the way, we can have tools that anyone can learn that stuff. And if someone does learn it at that level, Goldman Sachs, you should treat them as the same as, as an LSE graduate. There's so much that we can impact from like yeah. workplace and the future yes. of AI, there's, there's a lot. But I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Uh, we started a little bit after the time, so it's only fitting that we finish a few minutes past eight. Uh, thank you so much, Salcom, for thank coming you. Uh, to us for this fascinating discussion, which I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, by the way, uh, copies of Salcom's uh, book will be available for sale outside of the theater here, and he'll be staying around for signing. So I invite you all to join us for a complimentary drink and the foyer to continue the conversation. Please join me in a final round of applause. Thank you very much.